You're listening to another episode of the Coaster 101 Podcast. I'm Andrew Stillwell, and we are back from our short break with a very special guest this week. Uh, we're going to recap kind of the last couple of weeks since we've been off. There's been a lot of news in the industry, but I thought of no one better than Coaster Internet's favorite TikToker. Uh, you may know him from his Twitter account, Coaster Cuzzies, but more likely that TikTok account of the same name. Uh, we've got the Coaster Bro who... That's his online brand. That's how we're going to introduce him. But Coaster Bro, welcome to the Coaster 101 podcast. I'm so happy to be here. I'm in the same name as like uh, Tony Clark. So I feel like we're on the same level now at this point, not being on the show. So I yeah, that's, that a lot. that's there's been some some storied guests and you are <laughs> certainly one of those guests. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm blushing. <laughs> yes, I love it. Well, you and I, we go back a little bit. And if you did not take the opportunity when I guest starred on the Coaster Cuzzies podcast several months ago, I feel like at this point, um, Coaster Bro, he took the opportunity to ask me 69 questions. We had a little bit of an improv, uh, demonstrated how bad my improv acting skills were. Um, but Coaster Bro, what can you tell us about Coaster Cuzzies? Like, where you, what's your what's your Coaster Internet story? How do how should people find you? How do people know you? What's your story? Yeah, so Coaster Cuzzies, we're we're kind of a pre-pandemic thing. So we're like, hey, February 2020, let's launch this thing and uh, start a podcast. And how it started was uh, myself and Theme Park Stud actually worked at the Mamba at World of Fun as ride operators back in 2008. Which dates us a little bit, but um, yeah, we were just, uh, we worked there, we became best friends, and one day we were like, hey man, I've always had this dream of like doing a, a podcast, you want to do this podcast with me, and and that's how the Coaster Cuzzies started, so um, we're approaching on 100 episodes with a rebrand coming soon, and um, yeah, we got a lot of special stuff planned, but yeah, you can find us on, uh, on TikTok is where we're most prevalent at Coaster Cuzzies and um, really any social media at Coaster Cuzzies is where you're going to find us. I love it. And yeah, I want to talk a little bit about TikTok. You, I feel like more so than any other blogger, website, podcaster, internet personality. I think you have taken Coaster TikTok and kind of made it your own better than anybody else. So like, what's your, do you have a strategy behind it? Or are you just like, like, I know right now you're in the middle of counting down your top 75 amusement parks you visited. You've done your top 100 roller coasters, like one a day. I mean, what's your, what's your strategy for TikTok? My strategy for TikTok is the main thing, like even with Coaster Cuzzies is like, just like create stuff that you would want to listen to that, you know, I, I grew up listening to podcasts and, um, you know, there's just kind of this element missing and like with social media that I, I think of like, uh, this is like unrelated, but Pat McAfee, this great personality. Um, I was a big fan of him when he was a punter for the Colts back in the day. And now he's like this media all-star in the, in the sports game. Like what if there was like a Pat McAfee in the coaster community? That could be kind of fun. So <laughs> that's like my, my guy, my idol, I guess. So my strategy in like TikTok is, let your personality show a little bit, um, post a lot, talk to people whenever uh, you post and, and start a community there. And um, yeah, that's really the strategy is mostly have fun and uh, do it a lot. <laughs> I, I like it. Yeah. And you are, again, we, we do have some fun back and forth. You had your, you know, be a roller coaster enthusiast, like kind of dunking <laughs> on enthusiasts a little bit, like get the kitty credit, be a roller coaster enthusiast. <laughs> So that's a fun joke there. And you're always there in the comments. Always, always, always with the joke. And I, I, I've appreciated that for, I mean, over a year now at this point, you're just, you're always like one of the first to comment. I, yeah, you, I respect you, that. You never are supposed to read the comment section, but sometimes I just pop in there just cause, <laughs> and I, I'm going to beat this dead horse joke. Like, like there's no tomorrow and it's just going to be great. And you're doing I, it. And like, it's, um, I think people go to the comments to see your comment. Cool. Let's let's keep it that way, because I mean, I think you and I we're I think a similar age. We're you know early mid thirties ish. Yeah, thirty three for me. Yeah, me too. And so, <laughs> do you feel that TikTok is a platform as 
as an elder millennial, as I will refer to us, is it a is it a difficult platform to learn, or do you feel like how do you do, fellow kids, or like what is your? <laughs> See, here, here's my 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 like point of view on that, and just like social media in general, because like every time I talk to somebody my age or maybe a little bit older, it's like, yeah, man, like every every, every social media platform that comes out, it takes everybody a while to get there. Like Facebook, when it started, you had to be a college kid. And now it's like, it's where your grandma tells you happy birthday, right? (laughs) So everything kind of ages up. But like how I see it is like, that's a land grab. Like if I would have put the same effort into Instagram that I would into TikTok, I might have 2000 followers on Instagram, but on TikTok, I'm just like unjustfully sitting here at like 30 K, you know? (laughs) So it's a, I think, I think that's kind of like human nature for a lot of people as you're aging is like, Oh, because every social media starts with the, the hip new generation on it, doing dances or whatever. And like, you can still find your own voice on there. That's true. um, Is, is why I love TikTok so much. I love it. That is awesome. <laughs> well, part of your part of your I don't want to call it shtick. Shtick is not the fairest word to call what you do on TikTok. But every so often, uh, you you get on in the mornings and the weekends, and you do what we're going to call coffee with coaster. What you call coffee with coaster, bro. Yes. And um, I think, and you kind of recap the the news and uh, latest and greatest of what's going on in the industry. Um, as I uh, as we talk tonight, um, it is not coffee because coffee. For me, is a never beverage. I don't drink coffee, but wow. yeah, I've got a I've got a nice uh, Gatorade here. You've got some sort of canned beverage that you cracked before we. Uh, yeah. I have ooh, a ranch water. You got a ranch water, so we're gonna have beverages with Coaster Bro on this <laughs> podcast, and we're gonna recap since we've been off for so long. We're gonna recap some of the news, and we wouldn't be a good roller coaster podcast if we didn't at least touch on what's going on in Sandusky, Ohio, with the news that top thrill dragster as we know it is no more and in the brilliantly wordsmith statement that was very you had to read it a couple of times to see exactly what they were saying obviously if you don't know at this point um cedar points uh stratocoaster top thrill dragster it closed Last year, there was an incident where a guest was hit by a piece of debris from the ride. There's an ongoing story. Anyway, you can look at that. We're not here to talk about that. But the park did announce recently that Top Drill Dragster, again, as we know it, is no more. Um, What do we, first of all, I want to get your, your, if we've been following you on TikTok, we know that Cedar Point, not necessarily one of your favorite places, but what was your first thought when you saw this news? My first thought was good move. Just because like when you have a, when you have a ride that injures somebody, that's never a good thing. And, you know, and when it's like one of the most known roller coasters in the world and top thrill dragster, I think, I think the park's doing the right thing regardless of where they go with it. That's what okay. I would say. That was a that was a very diplomatic answer for somebody who is uh less than uh favorable <laughs> about Cedar Point most of the time. But <laughs> yeah, I was kind of I was in the same way and we we talked to uh our buddy Justin over at CP Food Blog. He kind of fed us to a uh, a local news station in Ohio to kind of talk about it from the enthusiast perspective and so I got to give a nice um news uh, interview to Spectrum News Cleveland. So if they're listening, shout out to you guys. Hopefully I didn't sound too dumb, but you removed the video after like 45 minutes. So anyway, um, so, but they asked me, you know, kind of my thoughts and I was like, yeah, I think Cedar Point is always going to do right by their guests. And while enthusiasts may be mad at things they do or things that other people publications do in regards to Cedar Point and their rankings in the top parks. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit too. I think Cedar Point is always going to do right by their guests. And so whatever they decide to do with Top Till Dragster, um, obviously the rumor mill is, you know, a new launch system. Is it going to be the same? Who knows? Are they going to take the top hat off? I just think it's an iconic part of that park skyline. And I just 
I'm curious to see, but I also think it's one of those that it's one of the rare occasions we really don't know at this point what the park has up their sleeve. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it could be so exciting too. Like, I think we all kind of like as a community, we're all kind of thinking, Oh, that might be a, an LSM launch. And then that's it. But like, think of the possibilities with that land, with that structure. Like this is exciting to me, whatever it becomes. I'm, I'm with you. And it, again, it's a, it's a big plot of land. They're moving some rides. Uh, if you listen to a previous episode, when we had Tony Clark on, uh, they're moving some flat rides to their new boardwalk section that could open up a, you know, rather sizable piece of real estate. Let's put our, our speculative hats on what's happening. What is your, let's, let me get your first thought coaster, bro. If Cedar point removes top throw dragster, what's going in that space? Can it be what I want? Sure, absolutely. Okay, here's what I want. I think you have a lot of land there on the launch and the brake system, and you have an iconic an iconic tower. Let's let's do top thrill dropster or whatever <laughs> it's called. Make it a zoom and gyro type ride. You have the drop tower, you have the iconic tower, and you have all this land to work with. You know, there's rumors out there that maybe maybe Corkscrew's on its last end or, you know, these are just rumors, of course. But what if you had a gigantic midway that was a blank slate? What if Cedar Point, the, the, the biggest park in the world without a dark ride, put in a dark ride? <laughs> oh, <laughs> what, oh if, what if you put in an area here? Like the, make it a, a, a sandbox, so to speak. I like it. That's you're going to anger literally every coaster enthusiast in the world by by costing the park two coasters in favor of a lowly dark ride. But you know what? Three. Wait, let's put in three coasters. You can fit three coasters in. Sure. Absolutely. We'll just we'll do a dark coaster. We'll do Cedar Point Wonder Mountains Guardian. We'll just make it happen. Do that. Put in your Gerslauer Infinity that everybody wants. Put in your GCI everybody wants. It's a sandbox. There's a lot of land there. You can do it. I love it. I think that's that's a solid play. I think a one of those just monster GCI or Gravity Group like modern wooden coasters, I think would just kill it there. But I also know from optics, you're not supposed to build a wooden coaster in the middle of a park and have it like be a focal point. Okay. I've, but the good news is we get to speculate this speculate about this forever until they announce something. So it's going to be great. Um, obviously. Big things coming to Cedar Point in the future, but on the opposite scale, big things, little things, but also big things coming to Bush Gardens, Williamsburg. Uh, the same day that um, Top Thrill Dragster, as we know it, again, with the air quotes, was uh, retired, Bush Gardens had their own announcement. And these things came out, I, I want to say, within like four minutes of each other. It was yeah. ridiculous that day. But the Curse of Dark Castle building, which has remained mostly dormant for the last couple of years, save for the odd Halloween maze or event space or whatever they decided to do with that building. Um, it's getting some new life and it's got a similar portmanteau name. Uh, we're having the dark instead of dark castle. We're having dark coaster or dark coaster. I don't I don't know how they want us to pronounce this. But I think it you is have to it, emphasize the dark, right? Dark coaster, yes. Dark coaster. Dark coaster. Dark coaster. <laughs> dark coaster. Yeah, it's like it's in the it's in the German section of the park, so maybe it's dark coaster. <laughs> yes, it's just screaming a little bit. Exactly. Um, <laughs> but this is a family launch coaster from Intamin. Uh, they have worked with SeaWorld Parks on these family launch coasters, like Wave Breaker, the Rescue Coaster. It's uh, SeaWorld in, down in Texas. Um, this is going to be, I was looking at the stats before we started recording, and of course it's right here. It's only got, um, it's less than 2,500 feet of track, um, but it's one of those that's a multi-launch with track switches and things like that, similar to Verbolton on a probably a much smaller scale, but the track is complete. What are your thoughts, Coaster Bro, on the addition of Dark Coaster to Busch Gardens Williamsburg, giving the park... It's 10th coaster, so it hits double digits. It's also the park's fourth multi-launch coaster. Wow. You know, I wish Dark Dark Castle. How did we say Dark Castle? We said Dark, Dark Castle. Dark Castle. 
So Kirst- it had to be dark coaster because you, 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 you pronounce both. Sure. Sure. Maybe yeah. That's what the capitalization is. You know, I, I thought that was one of the greatest regional dark rides ever and uh, may it rest in peace. I miss it forever. And I'm still always going to be a little salty about it, but what they're putting in, you know, it, it makes me not mad. Right. And I think, uh, I think the family coaster is going to be a good pick. I think there's some really good elements that you can theme to this. And I think it's going to be a huge hit. I agree. And I think it, it fills a niche at Bush gardens, Williamsburg and believe it or not, even with nine, now 10 coasters, there's still that just a little bit of a gap between mm-hmm. a coaster like Invader, which if we're going to pronounce capitals, it's Invade R. I mean, we're just <laughs> yeah, however we're pronouncing lot. capital letters here. <laughs> but there's still a bit of a gap between Invader and Verbolton, I feel like. And I feel mm-hmm. like the Dark Coaster will, will be a good way to kind of fix that. Is there a lot of similarities, I think, between the two? Um, with the indoor dark section, I mean, this is all indoors, but it is the, what is the, what did the park say? It's the world's only all indoor straddle coaster, I think was the the marketing speak they were using, which is, I'm again, I work in marketing communications for my real job. I am all for marketing speak, making something sound a lot cooler than it's actually maybe intended to be like in reality, this is a family coaster in the dark a la space mountain and space mountain obviously thrilling guest for years right. and this is kind of i feel like bush gardens williamsburg's attempt at a space mountain with you know modern ele- modern design and things like that and i think intamin they're gonna crush it they always do despite what most enthusiasts on the internet will say <laughs> but um I I'm with you. I think this is going to be a sneaky good roller coaster for the park. And I think it really accomplishes what the park is trying to do with that family demographic, you know, for the, the younger guests who are, you know, they're too big for Grover's Alpine express or whatever their zero little Grover coaster is called air Grover's Alpine express, whatever it is, whatever it is, but you know, you're, maybe invader is good for you, but this I think kind of fits that it's in that kind of very like a step above the kitty coaster tier, but it'll be good. And I think the enthusiasts will love it too. Um, just because again, it's intimate it's launches. There's what did I four or five, six launches on this thing. However many launches there are probably I, about 24. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like that. Who knows? <laughs> you know, it's, but with the multi launches and again, Bush Gardens has proven that they can do multi launch coasters well. Have you been on Pantheon? I'm not. I, I haven't been to this park since um, like Verbolton was the new ride when I went. So oh wow, like I'm realizing like sneakily, there's a ton of new coasters I need to get on. You you do, and you know, um, keep in mind when you come out here. I'm like five hours away. I can hop in the car. We'll go up there. We'll have we'll have a pretzel and beer at best un Breslin un beer, and we'll go uh, we'll go ride these new coasters. So it'll be a good time. And one thing I do want to point out too, you mentioned the the comparison to Mike Verbolton. Like, are we getting close to? Because you know you have the regional amusement park and you have the theme park, and people often are like. Ah, uh, it's Disney Universal, and over here is Busch Gardens, maybe Hershen. Like, are we starting to bridge the gap a little bit? Because, like, if if Disney opened two indoor coasters, I don't know if we bat an eye. Like, are, are they kind of flirting with that a little bit? I'm well, I'm yeah, I think we are blurring that line. But I do think um, that was a, that's a really good segue to kind of what I want to talk about next. But yes, I do think that that line is being blurred a little bit. Um, I do know a lot of the regional parks. I can speak really well to Carowinds, for example, with what they've done with Copperhead Strike and County Fair and what they're doing with the new Aeronautica Landing. Theming is becoming more and more of a staple in the regional park. It's no longer just the parking lot coaster, unless you're Six Flags, then it's just a parking lot coaster. Anyway, well, sorry. It's not even a coaster this year, so. That's also a good point. So, you know, good. Sorry about your dining plans. Thanks. Thank you have TikTok and coaster cousins to thank for that. Yes. Freaking TikTok, man. But on the subject of Disney and building indoor coasters that take long time to build anyway, 
um, another recent uh, event over the last weekend was D23 out in California. And I, I don't know if you're like me, our Twitter feed during the Parks and Resorts panel on Sunday was just, it was insane to sort through because you had the people who were in the panel. You had the people who were writing blogs really quick based on news in the panel and were posting those. You had the official Disney feed, which was two or three announcements behind and it was just leapfrogging one over another. It was a very, it was like the wild, wild west of twit theme park Twitter um, during that time period. But you know, was there anything at D23 when it comes to Disney parks that kind of surprised you or shocked you or you're particularly excited about? I don't know your thoughts on Disney parks in general, but. Well, I love Disney parks. They're, uh, they're actually some of my favorite parks. I haven't, I haven't been to one since 2019, which is a little odd. But um, obviously some things that like make me excited is to see like Disney's California Adventure. So I'm not really a, a big uh, was a big Hero 6 fan. Like, I think I watched it, maybe fell asleep during it. Yeah. But I am excited to see Disney's California Adventure kind of create a new land in that awkward space of Pacific Wharf between, you know, Radiator Springs and Pixar Pier. And to see that kind of come together and and see that park slowly just start to, you're, you're seeing different themes start to come in. And I'm excited to see, is it San Francisco? San Francisco. There's no capital letters, so we don't emphasize <laughs> anything weird. That's true. I'm just excited to see like a new land there. Yeah, and I think. See that ahead. park be more cohesive, I guess. I think so. And I've only been, it's been probably a decade since I've made it out to Disneyland. I think it was 2013 and I speed ran those two parks. I was trying to hit every highlight or way to, um, you know, compare attractions. Like I did space mountain. I did everything, but it's been years since I've been there. And I just, I haven't been back to the park since they've, you know, changed it into what is it? Pixar pier is the Mm -hmm. new Pixar area. Um, I don't know. There's a lot of there's a lot of conjecture, I will call the word, online about people who think that Disney is shoehorning too much IP into their parks. And I think yeah. it's definitely an argument for that. I, I think the IP is what makes Disney money. And the IP, if people can say, oh, I love Star Wars. I want to go spend $120 for a day to go to the Star Wars land or I mean, it's not just Disney doing this. I mean, Harry Potter, Universal is a park with the exception of, I think, Hollywood, Rip Ride, and Rocket. Everything in Universal is IP. Yeah. I th- and I think even uh, Poseidon's Fury maybe is not. But that might be public domain. I don't know where the mythology lies there. But <laughs> e- everything else there is IP. And so I, I don't think there is an issue really with the IP. There are some cases where I feel like the IP is we'll call it shoehorned. I think the Moana experience and Epcot that is opening in 2023, the journey of water. um, Sure. I I get it. You have a journey of water. It used to be called the living seas. It's now the seas is with Nemo and friends. That's your journey. (laughs) That's your journey of water to me. But you know, if you can put Moana in the park, maybe guests will be like, Oh, I want to go see Moana. Because you can't put her in World Showcase because Moana is Hawaiian, right? Yeah, some sort of Polynesian island for sure. I'm okay. not sure if it's technically Hawaii or not. Okay, well, unless we get a Polynesia World Showcase pavilion anytime soon, but it Which doesn't... Would be good. dope. <laughs> really would be. And That'd I think be a really good one. The, only, the only thing that would make more sense for Disney would be to make a Brazil pavilion and have them do a, uh, a churrascaria, a Brazilian steakhouse. Ooh. Think of the prices they could charge for unlimited meat in Disney World that people would pay. Probably with, up to 150 With all of the Brazilian tourists. I think that's... Disney, if you're listening, this is... Uh, you can have this one for free. The next one will cost you, though. Maybe so, one meal at the, at the Brazilian restaurant would be Exactly, nice, so. yes. This is, this is the idea. I can't be the first person who's brought this up in a focus group. Um, <laughs> but some other announcements at D23. Uh, we received some details about uh, Tiana's Bayou Adventure, which is the 
refurbished, rethemed, reimagined Splash Mountain. Uh, best described as a love letter to New Orleans, which is going to be good. I think it's going to fit in better at uh, Disneyland than it will Disney World a little bit. But I think, you know, if the rumors are to be believed or the blue sky phase is to be talked about, that might not like Splash Mountain becoming Tiana's Bayou Adventure might not be the only thing worth talking about at the Magic Kingdom. Did you see these what the what Disney and everybody referred to as blue sky ideas? Yes, and I actually learned what blue sky meant through your article, so I appreciate that. But yeah, basically these are these are things that we might put in somewhere. Right? Is that the Some, idea? Yeah, somewhere, someday. Uh, there's a a a land themed Coco. There is a which I ha- again haven't seen. I need to get up on my Disney movies. I'm way behind. But Coco there's a, is beautiful. Like the the animation of that. I would love to see that blue sky thing come true. That'd be good. And then Encanto is another one. And then they talked about what the long rumored villains land. Which I think could be really cool. You know, there's talk about, you know, Disney After Dark, where it's this fifth gate as a village villains park and things like that. I think, I do think they jumped the gun a little bit because, or if they didn't jump the gun, literally everybody on the internet jumped the gun because there were websites that go by initials and end in NT. And I'm not going to say the first three, but it's Walt Disney World. They were saying, this is confirmed, this is happening, and, you know, it's a clickbait factory, and I don't follow the other website that claims to go inside the magic. Um, I don't follow them anymore, but I'm sure they were... try not to. Yeah, I was... (laughs) I'm sure they were saying the same things, like, oh my gosh, this is happening, this is confirmed. Blue Sky is just an idea phase, and, you know, we've talked to people in the industry on this podcast before... Um, Dave Cobb is somebody who comes to mind talking about things that are in blue sky and just the ideation of an idea. And that's what it is. And be it if it's land behind Thunder Mountain, that's beyond Thunder Mountain that connects frontier land to fantasy land through some arbitrary pathing, or if it's a fifth gate for Walt Disney world, these ideas are very impressive. I am, I'm excited to see if they ever come to fruition. That said, Disney has already hinted in the fact that they are into 2027 in their construction schedules because the Tokyo Disneyland Space Mountain is beginning in 2024, which at this point, still two years away. We are still planning on the refurbishment of attraction of an attraction that will take three years, two years from now. And we all know that given construction schedules being what they are, And I know they went through a pandemic, but Tron, the light cycle ride coaster, the Shanghai Disneyland coaster, Mm -hmm. which pre-exists at a park in Shanghai, by the way, has taken more than five years to open. It was announced in 2017. It will it will officially open in spring of 2023. Um, And again, I know the pandemic was in the middle there, but I I see your pandemic and I raise you Velocicoaster, which was built. (laughs) mid pandemic in like eight months. And amazing. Yes. I still have not ridden Velocicoaster. I think I'm like, I'm quick. Okay. This is good. Coaster, bro. We're taking a road trip. We're we're taking this show on the road. We're just going to, we're going to go to Williamsburg. We're going to go to Carowinds. We're going to do all these places. Just come on to the East coast. It's all good over here. We got good barbecue too. You want to know a secret? Absolutely. You got Velocicoaster. You got Iron Glass. You got all these coasters. You know what actually might get me back to Orlando soon? Uh, ooh. The surf coaster at SeaWorld? No. <laughs> it's that nighttime spectacular coming back. Okay. <laughs> at Magic Kingdom. Oh, my gosh. Uh, I'm so excited. So you're a, bit, you're a big fireworks guy? I mean, I was thinking about this. Like, when, when you told me I was going to be on the show and I looked through this, I was like, think about the, the, the Magic Kingdom experience. Mm-hmm. Fireworks on Main Street, the castle... I think for most people is ranked above like the top coaster there. Like I got to see the fireworks. I'm with you. And what is, I don't even know if it's arguably the best show that's ever shown there. I keep forgetting the name of it. Wishes. 
Happily Devil Ever Wishers, After? I've seen Happily Ever After is coming back. Yes. That thing As was part there of for like something a else. A year or two, right? It was, and mm-hmm. then it was gone. And I expected yeah. it to be there like 20 years. So I'm, I'm excited for that to come back because I didn't get to see it. Yes. And then they've also announced, in addition to the Figment meet and greet, which is going to take a year and a half to uh, to make the suit happen, to happen. You already uh, know, isn't the suit already made? Uh, I'm sure it is. I think they need a modern Figment. I don't know. Something wow. that I've seen pictures. There was the Dreamfinder who had the Figment puppet, which would be really cool. But then you got to reintroduce the concept of the Dreamfinder, and nobody knows who that is anymore, which is just terribly sad. But there's also the giant, you know, eight foot tall purple dragon, mm-hmm. as Eric Idle would call him, an animated little bleeper. <laughs> um, but he's an animated big beeper at that point. Um, um, but I think. They're also getting a nighttime spectacular to replace Harmonious, which did not have the best run. I feel like they they spent a lot of time, a lot of effort to build those taco shaped barges in the middle of World Chase <laughs> Lagoon. And I was I was a big fan of Illumination, so Same. I have not been back to Walt Disney World to see Harmonious. So I probably am not giving it a fair shake here. But I think um, given what I read on the internet. And again, the internet, very passionate place when it comes to two things. Well, many things, but specifically this podcast, theme park fans are very passionate. They love their roller coasters. They love their regional parks. Disney fans are a whole nother level. And this, this goes back to, you know, when we in peak pandemic form or right after the pandemic, whatever it was. We did the top 100 Twitter accounts for theme park people to follow. And um, there are a lot of Disney fans who were very mad at Coaster101.com, a website they had never previously heard of before that day, for not including them on their list. So Disney fans, very passionate. And uh, yeah, if Harmonious is as bad as the internet says it is, it maybe it's due to be replaced. Yeah. So, but... Um- I'm just excited that the taco bar is maybe gone. They might be, but I already hate them and I haven't seen them yet. Well, that's what the internet taught me. Exactly. You you can't put anything on the internet that isn't true. So, <laughs> but okay, we're going to get, we're going to, we're going to segue again into some more internet conjecture. Okay. And this of course results into the golden ticket awards. I've got the golden ticket. Yes. We're going to get DMCA by like the Warner Brothers people if you sing any more of that song. So let's just. Right on pitch. So. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, the golden tickets, uh, kind of the best of the best of the amusement industry. And there are awards in there for, you know, best water park, which Slitterbond wins every year, or best marine wildlife park, which I believe SeaWorld Orlando has won. Um, but there are other there are other awards of, out there. Uh, Europa Park in Germany won Best Amusement Park for the, I believe, eighth year in a row. Uh, Fury Three Two Five at my home park of Carowinds won Best Steel Coaster. Phoenix at Knobles won Best Wooden Coaster. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can head to GoldenTicketAwards.com to look at the full list of uh, winners. But better yet, you can head to Coaster101.com where we've got the same list, and uh, that makes me feel better if you click on our website. But one thing that the Golden Tickets do each year is they rank the top 50 steel roller coasters. And they rank the top 50 wooden roller coasters. Uh, The voters, these awards are, um, they're determined by voters uh, who are in the industry, out of the industry. I know I personally am a voter. Uh, They keep sending me ballots. So shout out to the Golden Ticket Awards for uh, sending me a ballot and letting me vote in this thing. But these um these roller coaster lists they're always kind of funny. I mean, you've got your usual suspects here at the top. You've got Fury three two five, as I mentioned, at Carowinds has won Best Steel Coaster, I believe, every year since two thousand sixteen. And you've got Steel Vengeance right behind it. You've got Millennium Force, and then you've got some newcomers on the list: Iron Gwazi, which everybody seems to love. Haven't ridden it. Jurassic World Velocicoaster, haven't ridden it. And then. Um, Some other ones that are traditionally near the top are Expedition G-Force at Holiday Park in Germany, Superman the Ride, Apollo's Chariot, Intimidator 305, and then rounding out the top 10 are Maverick. But then towards the bottom, you've got some interesting 
rides on this list. And I don't know if this is just the voters biased, but you've got Shockwave at Six Flags Over Texas, which it's it's an okay ride. You've ridden it, right? Yeah. It's fine. I think that's about where I put it on my list. What, 50? 47? Uh, I think it breaks my top 50. Okay. Well, I mean, it's it's there. Um, but you've got uh, Wizard. They're not ranking and, the world either, by the way. They're that's not fair. In the world. No, the, yeah, these are ranked in the world. And 50 is Wizard at um, Six Flags Great America. Um, and then, you know, you've got rides like Pantheon, which is new this year. It's down at 43. You've seen this list. I've, I've got to ask you, are there any coasters, A, you're surprised, are on the top 50 wood and steel list? And B, are there, are there any coasters you're surprised did not crack the top 50? You know, with, with this list, I'm never surprised completely by anything. Because kind of when I look at the voting here, it, it seems like there might be like a heavy population of like people in home parks voting for like their nostalgic rides which i think is how like wizard makes top 50 right yes because i mean wizard wizard's not top 50 no it's it's <laughs> a it's a piece of history i wrote yeah. it in 2019 when i was at great america it was fun but but if, if you like grew up and wrote it with your grandpa it would be in your top 50 which i think i think a lot of the voters that's the case <laughs> But they only get to rank the top 10. So there are people who are putting oh this in. Oh, my gosh. In. Yeah, you only get to rank 10. Oh, my gosh. I did not know that. Yeah. So it's it's uh, it's receiving some solid votes in probably the 7 to 10 category. But wow. I'm yeah, looking- that's, that's mind-blowing to me. Because that, is that even – I mean, that's barely even top five at the park, isn't it? Well, let's let's see. You've got – um goliath which is on the it's on the list one of the lists somewhere maybe the wooden list yeah yeah i don't know how these i still have yet i'm a bad enthusiast i haven't figured out what classifies as rmc as wood versus steel i know it's i box versus topper track versus a bunch of stuff to me an rmc is an rmc yeah don't don't come for me internet and if you do uh you can find me on tiktok at coaster cuzzies Um, (laughs) wait that's not that's not that's not where you go Oh, well, anyway, um, but yeah, I just think there's some, there's some things on this list and you've got like, for example, um, time traveler, helix, blue fire, mega coaster and ride to happiness. And there's one other one I think on this list. No, there's not, but the mock mock rides kind of launched spinning coasters. I personally think, and I ranked this in my top 10, maybe there's a little bit of home park bias on my end. Copperhead strike is a Mm. better ride than wizard. It is a better Mm. ride than shockwave. I, I would put it as a better ride, honestly, to me than Alpengeist. And I'm, I'm, it's better than Montu. It's better than intimidator at Carolyn's at the same park. So I think copperhead strike was robbed. I'm interesting. Yeah. You think it would have popped in. You think, but again, we I don't control the voters. I don't I don't But if it's only if it's only top ten. Yeah. Are there are there people that are voting for this that are like, oh Intimidator, underrated, is my home park, lots of airtime. Like is that I, I think Intimidator is more likely to see in somebody's top ten as like, oh okay, that's kind of an outlier, but fine. Than like Copperhead Strike. I feel like more people go to bat because we're going for top tens here. Yeah, the more people go to bat for the hyper coaster, they I mean, people do love their B&Ms. And I mean, all those all those B&M hypers and gigas. I mean, you've got Fury at one. You've got uh, Apollo Chariot at eight. Um, let's see. Leviathan, Mako, Diamondback at 15, 16, 17. Candemonium, Orion, Nitro, 19 through 21. So that's I want to say nine or 10 out of your top 21 are B&M hypers. And. Don't get me wrong. I voted for all of those. I I have them all in my top 10 or close to it. I mean, but I think it's is it is weird because you've got you've got those that are kind of like nationally worldwide recognized. And then Mm -hmm. you've got something like Goliath at Six Flags over Georgia, which while is on the list is kind of far down at uh, 41. 
So I that think my top 10. Yeah. I'm going to say it's, it's such a odd list, but it, I do, you know, I feel like a, I clocked in, I kind of checked the list and see, saw what I had written. I've been on 22 of the top steel coasters, which is good as someone who is a larger size, who's been walked off several of these other coasters, you know, steel vengeance. Thanks for nothing. Um, <laughs> But I think, and then I've been on, I think, 20 of the uh, top wooden coasters. And the wooden list is, it's your your usual suspects at the top. You know, Phoenix, Voyage, El Toro, Boulder Dash, and Beast. They're going to be top five on pretty much any wooden coaster list of any enthusiast who's ridden all these rides. And I just, you know, when you get down to six through ten, you got Mystic Timbers, Ravine Flyer 2, which is fantastic, Ghost Rider and Knots. Outlaw Run at Silver Dollar City and Thunderhead. All really good rides, I'm assuming. Silver Dollar City, you've been to. I haven't. That one's one's great. It it belongs. All right, cool. We're good then. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But again, you get down to the bottom of this list, and you see things like, hang on, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Um, American Thunder at um, (laughs) Six Flags St. Louis. Another, you're a a proud Missourian, Missouriite. Yeah, Um, yeah, and I don't go over there too much, but I think those three Woodies, I mean, they got it wrong. I think I think that's the best of the three at right. the bottom. And then you've got Boss, and then you've got Screaming Eagle all the way up at 38. So you've got three wooden coasters from Six Flags St. Louis. Um, Which, I don't know if it's a park really known for its wooden coasters, right? Um, it's... Surprise! I mean, because you don't really have a unique stand out there unless you want to say Mr. Freeze. Right. Uh, the wooden coaster line, especially in recent years, they've taken care of their woodies and they're smooth again. Right. But, um, yeah, I mean, they're not – there's no standout coaster in that park. Yeah. And, I mean, there's a there, – to me, a roller coaster that should absolutely be on this list that is not – is the racer at Kings Island, especially with all the work that's been done in recent years. I just had to control F while we were on this list to make sure it wasn't on there and that I wasn't overlooking it, but it is not on the top 50. That's ridiculous to me. And then like, well, Kennywood is Kennywood's racer on there. It is. Kennywood's racer is Kennywood's all of uh, Kennywood's wooden coasters are on there. There's racer racer is, uh, is t- tied for tied for 33rd Thunderbolt is 20th and Jack rabbit. Uh, one of my personal favorites. I think I ranked that top three mm. is, uh, is 12th. So, you know, to Kennywood getting, I mean, this is Pennsylvania park. So I guess it shouldn't surprise us, right? This is true. I mean, Pennsylvania parks, they do, they, they have a very passionate fan base. And I know it was the Ace the Ace Convention was up there last year, I believe. I think it was at Hershey. And that's important. It is. I think there's a lot of recency bias with a lot of these people. I think that's why uh Lightning Racer, which I believe is R.I.P., right? That's the no. Oh, you're thinking of Wildcat. I am thinking of Wildcat. Never mind. Forget I said anything. <laughs> Again, I don't know what I'm talking about, but I just host a podcast. Anyway. But so to to go back to the Acer thing though. Um, yeah. I used to be a ride operator in 2009 of the Prowler, and that's when they had their big ace event there, and we threw a dang party for Night ERT. You better believe that it got Best New Coaster of the Year in 2009. It did. And I've, I've ridden Prowler. Prowler at night, that is special. Especially and the year it opens. <laughs> Real special. Yeah, I was going to say. It was... <laughs> I just, I remember that ride and it was one of my, I think my first ride on it was a night ride and it was just bananas. It was so good. Yeah. But yeah, I think the, uh, the golden ticket's always a fun exercise. You can kind of see, you know, the parks you've been to, the parks you need to go to for certain reasons. Like I haven't been to Knobles. They have the best food and have won this several years in a row running. And you wouldn't think of a small park in Elysburg, Pennsylvania as having like good food. Mm-hmm. But apparently they just kill it. Have you been? Uh, Knobles is my favorite park. And okay. I will stand by every Knobles award that is ever given. But the, the dietary needs suffer a little bit. So I'm like, for me, I don't think it's a top part because like just down the road at Hershey Park, the dietary needs of like if you have a certain allergy, like they've got it all mapped out. Knobles, you have to like DM them and they're like, oh, yeah, there's supply chain issues. So bring your own food. <laughs> <laughs> so like 
I don't I don't know if I agree with them as the best food. Right. But like if you don't have an allergy, it's pretty dang good. That's good. That's good to know because as someone with with not food allergies, mm-hmm. I'm good. We're yeah. we're uh, <laughs> you're gonna have a party, man. I'm ready. I just I got to get up there. That's the key. I just those are the two parks. Like two of the parks to me. There's three really that just really stick out as parks I haven't been to that I really want to go to. Silver Dollar City is one mm-hmm. because they're everything that's there from time traveler to the big B and M that everybody takes pictures of. What's the name of it? That Wildfire. I'm, thank you. Wildfire to Outlaw Run. I just think it's Powder so, Cake. Powder Cake. Exactly. I need to get out to Branson, Missouri. I need to get my yellow uh, Branson bound sweatshirt like I'm in the movie. Uh, she's out of my league and just get on a flight and get out there. Um, but then also the other two parks are Knobles and Hershey Park. And as we sit here tonight, yes. you've got your Hershey Park hat on. Yes. You love Knobles. It's just, it's it should the, absolutely book the book it now. Go. Oh, those okay. are, those are three of the best parks in America. I'm going to make it happen. Yeah. I don't know are, when, but I'm going to make it happen. I say, uh, try the fall for Knobles. That's like a dream for me. Knobles is one of my favorite parks. So is Hershey. And so is so dark. They all make my top 10. Spoiler so, alert. Yeah. I was going to say spoiler alert for the TikTok. This is, uh, we're what are you like day sixty five? Like, it's gonna be a while, so you'll probably forget about it. Yeah, so like two <laughs> two months when you're listening to this cat this podcast in the back catalog, we already know what three of the top ten are going to be. So it's yes. great. <laughs> wow. But, uh, can, can I make one more point about the golden tickets that I actually absolutely? Like? Yeah. Uh, one thing I like about it is when you think about the golden tickets, I think a lot of people think of like there's a lot of like older people kind of voting in it, and sometimes you kind of see like. That's where some of the nostalgia pulls in and you see some of these top coasters like I think wizard. about <laughs> yeah, wizard. And I think about like even uh, Six Flags New England with the Superman ride. That ride 10 to 15 years ago, people talked about all the time, but not necessarily like in our social media world world for some of our like younger people that are participating in the community. I think it's unique because like some of these older folks aren't on Instagram talking about El Toro all the time. And it's just kind of interesting to see like, oh, there's kind of this silent part of the community that loves these rides and those get kind of put up on a pedestal. And I think that's kind of kind of cool yeah. to see. I think uh, for a lot of people, the coaster community is like they're they think of it as people their age. And yes. I mean, like guys like you and me and the most of the coaster 101 team, except for Shane, because he's really young. Right. We're all late 20s, early 30s. You know, we've we just go. We enjoy having a good time at parks. We're not the hardcore patch jean jacket wearing ace members. But you know what? There's still a ton of them out there. Yeah. I remember when I was at Bush Gardens uh, to ride Pantheon. It was had a three hour delay to start the day. The only people in line were me and a bunch of ace members. And I could tell because the one guy was talking about his cred count. And he was this older guy. He was at like. 1200 credits and pantheon was going to be number 1200 for him and i was like cool i'm still under 300 it's fine (laughs) but i just i do love the the thing i love about this hobby and this community is the like-mindedness of people like we all have opinions again conjecture opinions we're very passionate about our opinions and the things we feel about our parks and our likes and our dislikes but at the end of the day, we all love theme parks. We all love roller coasters. And part of that is in this community, you get to meet people, you know, who you become friends with and are cool with. You and I are a great example of that. Obviously, we're like internet buddies, have never met in person, but now we've been on each other's podcasts. I'm in the comment section of your TikToks. You know, it's just, it's a really cool thing where you can just kind of meet people with like interests. And for the most part, I say most part because there are the occasional bad apples out there. Everybody's cool. And it's just, it's great to just interact with fellow coaster fans and, you know, again, have them on podcasts, have them on TikTok comics, se- comment sections. It's just a good time. So. And while we're being sentimental, I, uh, the differing views even are, are, are what makes me excited about it. That, that people can like, the fact that I have like teenagers 
that are hitting me up on TikTok and like Vacoma boomerangs aren't that bad. You know, they're saying that. And I'm like, gosh, this community really is great. This is this is great. <laughs> we just need to educate the youth of America yeah. a little bit better. Somebody loves them. It's it's one of the four <laughs> rides at their park in England and it's their favorite thing, you know? Crazy. Well, before we wrap this up, anything else you want to talk about or plug or you mentioned a rebrand. What, what can you tell us? Can you give us any scoop on the rebrand? I will give you a tease because I uh, literally just came up with this five minutes before I started recording with you. Um, but if you know the coaster cuzzies, you know, there's like this other podcast that we mess with a lot. Like we're good friends they maybe have been gone for a little bit. Maybe they're coming back a little bit. It's not us. <laughs> it's definitely not Coaster 101. <laughs> They've got blogs to write. They've got, they're busy. Um, but, yeah, there might be a little merger coming for the Coaster Cuzzies. And, um, you know, I'm just really excited with the content that may be coming out of this. I like that's, it. That's all I can say right now. I, ooh. Again, so, uh, effective tease. Which, if you know the Coaster Cuzzies. You know what I'm talking about. So it's and like, it, who's the Coaster Cuzzies that are listening to the end of the Coaster 101 podcast? They'll know. Right. And if if you're not a Coaster Cuzzy, you got to you gotta get on it. Might as well. Exactly. Coffee, <laughs> beverages with Coaster Bro, be a roller coaster enthusiast, top 75 countdown on TikTok. You got to be there for all of it. So. We're having a party. And, and you can find all of our stuff. Like, obviously, we're on TikTok at Coaster Cuzzies. If you don't know how to spell Cuzzies, do this. Go to solo.to slash coaster cuzzies. Oh wait. Yeah, we gotta we gotta spell that though. If you don't know how to spell cuzzies, C U Z Z I E S. You got it. I appreciate but you helping. I gotta ask real quick before yes. we wrap this up. What is a cuzzy? So yeah, a cuzzy. So to reference that, I, I did mention Pat McAfee earlier in the show. A word he loves to use is cuzzies. And as I kind of mentioned earlier. Like he's kind of like the persona of what I like and what I want to kind of bring to the coaster community. So I, I stole his word blatantly. I don't know if that's allowed or not. But Cuzzy, how we use it is Cuzzy's a listener. Cuzzy's somebody that's a part of the podcast. Cuzzy's a part of the community. So if you mess with us, you're a Cuzzy. I like it. So there you are, the Coaster Cuzzies. Well, there we go. Ladies and gentlemen, the Pat McAfee of the coaster community Coaster Bro from Coaster Cuzzies, thank you so much for joining us on the Coaster 101 podcast. That's going in an Instagram bio somewhere. Let's let's make it happen. Make it happen right now. But that's going to do it for this week's episode of the Coaster 101 podcast. After you visit solo.to slash Coaster Cuzzies, uh, head to another website, Coaster101.com. We've got recaps of everything we've talked about. Uh, Cedar Points, the retirement of Tap Thrill Dragster, the addition of Dark Coaster, the Golden Ticket Awards, and D23, so be sure to check that out at Coaster101.com. Uh, we're also on all forms of social media, although not as prevalent on TikTok as our good buddy, Mr. Cuzzy's here, uh, but we are at Coaster101, and if you're liking, or if you're listening to this podcast, make sure you're also liking, rating, reviewing, subscribing, telling your friends, going in TikTok comment sections, and telling people to listen to the Coaster101 podcast. Again, that is TikTok.com slash at Coaster Cuzzies. Go to those comment sections. Tell them to listen to the Coaster 101 podcast. This has been sponsored TikTok content. Anyway, thanks. Is as, actually, sorry, is there a URL for TikTok? Like I you believe, go at Coaster Cuzzies? I, I think so. It's TikTok.com slash at something. Wow. It's, it's weird that it's like slash at, but yeah, I think it's just the way it goes. Hey, and, and if you are literally typing into the URL for a TikTok... Once you figure out what a DM is, DM me, and I want to know if that's how you found it. Hey, if that happens, we'll make it happen. <laughs> I just want to know. <laughs> cool. So thanks, as always, to Justin Mabry of JM Music Design for our theme music, and we will talk to you again soon. See ya. See ya.